and uh, our special thanks uh, to Professor Suelin Huang, uh, who has uh, accepted uh, kindly our invitation uh, to be part of this uh, series of, um, of webinars. Uh, professor Juan is a um, professor at the Department of Biostatistics uh, of the University of Texas, MD Anderson Cancer Center. And, and he has a vast experience and contributions in several areas uh, relate, related to health and in particular to cancer studies, uh, including survival analysis, uh, clinical trial design, and, and longitudinal data uh, analysis. Uh, we have had a very long relationship with Professor Wang because he is uh, our partner. He is the co-leader of Data Omics um, Core of the U54 uh, Excellence in Cancer Research, a collaborative research between the MD Anderson Cancer Center and the Comprehensive Cancer Center of the University of Puerto Rico. And I have had the pleasure to be um, a, a, a co-leader uh, of this core. And we have, a, a, over the years, wonderful communication and, and collaborations. And so uh, to this meeting, he, uh, this, by the way, this webinar is part of the course that uh, this semester uh, Data Omics is, uh, is giving about um, uh, analysis, uh, data science analysis of uh, cancer studies. And, and in that sense, uh, it's very interesting that MD Anderson researchers are being part of the course we are giving here in the other medical uh, campus. Um, uh, Professor Juan has said that he would love to have um, uh, interactions and anybody of you that, that want to have raise a question, please raise your hand and, and I will convey then, then the possibility to give a, a, a questions in real time to Professor Juan. Again, thanks a lot, uh, Suelin. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. Thank you, Dr. Perici, for your nice introduction. Uh, it has been my pleasure and the learning opportunity to collab collaborate with you in uh, these uh, many years, and it's my pleasure and and also learning opportunity to collaborate with the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for all the opportunities and um, uh, uh, cancer research experience we have um, worked together. Uh, today I will talk about um, multiple comparisons. Uh, that that will be a transition from uh, from p value to q value. Is moving right? Is uh, the page is um, uh, going down? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Going yeah. So, okay. So today I will first talk about uh, start from uh, understanding type 1 error and the false discovery rate. And then uh, we need to learn how to control the type 1 error and the false discovery rate and understand the, the analog between p value and the q value. Uh, we start from type 1 error. Uh, suppose, like, we first consider just a one single uh, hypothesis testing. For example, uh, in, in a cancer center, we always consider this kind of question like, uh, I have a new drug. My hypothesis is that the response rate of this new drug for leukemia patients will be higher than 50%. And you really, this 50% is the best the current standard therapy can do. Currently, uh, the best uh, response rate is 50%, and we, we want to find a new drug that can do better than the current one. And translate this into statistical testing language, that means we have a non-hypothesis. So we call it H0, that uh, response rate is less or equal to 50%. And uh, 
our our alternative hypothesis is that the response rate is greater than fifty percent. And um, we need to note here the two uh, hypotheses are not exchangeable. It's not like we can, oh, we are testing one against the other, we, we can exchange them. No, no, it's not, it's not like that. Uh, we always put our desired outcome that we want to approve. That is the non, that's the alternative. That's the alternative hypothesis. And we always put the outcome of no improvement, no discovery. That is always the non now hypothesis, H now. And to put it in this way, if we accept the alternative hypothesis, and then that's a very good news, is a, is a new drug discovery. Um, so we want to ensure when we claim a discovery, our chance of making a mistake of, of it's sufficiently small. We, we don't want to claim we have a new drug and later on we find out, oh, it does not work. It works just the same as before or even a little bit worse. We, 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 we can never say, oh, we want 100% sure, but we want like at least 95% sure. <laughs> okay, now suppose we tested the new drug on 20 patients and the 12 of them responded in this case, uh, we, that's the observed response rate is 60%. Uh, then we're facing a decision. Uh, should we accept the non-hypothesis and reject the alternative and conclude the response rate less than 50% or should we say the response rate is greater than 50%? Uh, if you are a statistician, you know we have a lot of things to do here, but uh, from outsiders, they may think, oh, your statisticians are, are asking silly questions. The response rate from the data is 60%, certainly is greater than 50%. So we should say, uh, we find a new drug, we should reject the non-hypothesis. So is it really like that simple? No, uh, if we are always making uh, uh, inference in this way, then we will have a big chance leading to wrong conclusions. We, if we work in this way, just by looking at the face, face value or face, or the kind of simple observed raw response outcome, resp response rate, easy to be wrong. Let, why? Uh, suppose the true response rate is just as good as the current one, 50%, not a little bit more better, just the same. Then what is the chance uh, we can still observe an outcome that is better than 50%, like 12 out of 20, 60% response rate? What is, what is the chance, what is the probability to see that? That's, that's easy to, to do the computation. We, uh, for those, uh, uh, we use the, the software R to do the computation by this function, the probability of binomial distribution. This, this probability, uh, P binomial 11, 12.5 with these three parameters. That gives the probability to have 11 or less responders out of 20 responders when the response rate is, true response rate is 50%. I will go back to this uh, statement, like what does that mean? The true response rate is 50%. But so far, let's concentrate on the um, probability calculation. That means if the truth is 50% and then uh, we have 25% to see 12 or more responders out of 20. That means if we conclude the response rate is, is greater than 50%, if we claim a new discovery, our chance of error is 25%. 25% 
25% of making a wrong statement. Uh, in this case, we say the type one error is 25%. And formally speaking, type one error in our st statistical language is the chance that the non hypothesis is rejected when actually it is true. Why is it called a type one error? And because we call that the next one type two, we always need to give it a name. The type two error is the chance when the alternative hypothesis is true, but is, re is rejected. And so sometimes we talk about the power Power is one minus type two error, or it's, it's the power to make, to, to really find something, truly a discovery. And as I said, we want, um, it, we don't allow the, our chance to make a mistake too big. So we want to control the type one error to usually less than 5%. And we always give, call it alpha. In the above example, the type one error is 25%, that's way too big than, than 5%. So in this case, uh, we should accept the now, that means no improvement and the reject the, the alternative. And we conclude no sufficient evidence for uh, to say for the statement that this is a new discovery uh, to say that it's a the response rate for the new drug is greater than 50%. Uh, note here, we, we don't say, oh, we conclude that the response rate is less than 50%. We don't say in this way. We, we should, the correct way to state is that we do not have sufficient evidence to say the response rate is greater than 50%. It's simply no evidence yet. But that does not mean we, we, we conclude that the response rate is for sure less than 50%. Clearly, no evidence for that part either. Oh. Um, then suppose we, we keep going uh, to, to treat more patients. And now we have 80 patients and 48 of them responded. And this gives the same 60% response, response rate. In this situation, if we reject at no, what is the type one error? Do the same calculation as before. Simply, we change the total number, it's 80. That's the middle number in the function P by norm. And what is the chance to have 47 or less patients uh, re to respond? And one minus of that, that's 5%. That means the type one error now is 5% and this is the acceptable. This type one error uh, is like meets our usual criteria. In this case, so we decided to reject the non-hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. And that meaning uh, we need to ob ob observing 48 out of 80 to to conclude, the, the, the true response rate is greater than 50%. And that's how we use p-value to control type one error. Like this type one error is a p-value for, for this one-sided test. Uh, if we keep going uh, with, the, with the more patients, 100 patients with the 60 responders, the same test, we have a p-value. You see getting smaller, now it's 0.03. <clears throat> even smaller than 0.05. And uh, what we do here is like, uh, we, that's what we, we do every day. If we see a p-value less than 0.05, we reject the non-hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. And what we do re requiring p-value less than 5%, five, 5 a small probability number, that, that's our way to control a type one area in a single test setting. Uh, any questions here? Uh, and as I said, like uh, when we say the statement, 
the true response rate is 50%. Uh, like when you, we have 20 patients, we observe the trial, we, we observe 60%, but we are statisticians are saying such kind of language. The true response rate is 50%. What, what does that mean? This, the true parameter value in statistics in statistics, it simply means that's the population par parameter. Suppose we totally have 100,000 leukemia patients, that's all of them, everybody included. And if all of them receive this new drug and 50% of them will respond, that is 50,000 50, of them will respond, then that we say the true response rate is uh, 50%. This is it's simply the population level true value. And previously those data we observed 20 patients, 80 patients or 100 patients, they are a sample from the whole population of, uh, oh, actually here I put 100,000, and I accidentally make it 1 million. And the response rate estimated from a, a sample of patients as randomness, 20 patients, 80 patients, 100 patients, is a small subset, small sample from the big population. So it may not exactly reflect the true value. That's, that's perfectly understandable. So we should not use the kind of observe the response rate from a small sample size to uh, kind of to understand it as exactly uh, that's the truth because it has some randomness. And uh, that means even though you already have 100 patients, you got another 100 patients, you, ma you make it a higher or lower value. Uh, the, the, how big is the randomness? It's our... Um, essential job as a statistician to, to quantify it, to uh, quantify the uncertainty, quanti quantify the variation. Now switch to multiple testing. Suppose now we, we, we have not just one drug, we have um, 100 drugs to test. Uh, for, for simplicities, suppose they all have response rate 50%. If we do the same testing as before, each, each of the drugs has five chance to reject H0. That means to be claimed as a, as a new discovery. Then out of these 100 drugs, very likely we, we will have five of them uh, be claimed new discovery. That is just on average, we will have five. Uh, Certainly, uh, it, it also has a variation. Uh, we, have, we claim we have five discoveries, but actually none of them is. They, they work all as, as the same as before. None of them is an improvement. So out of the five discoveries, five of the discoveries, five of them are false. So the false discovery rate in this example is five out of five, that's 100%. So we are, we are now um, using the concept called false discovery rate, FDR. Uh, I just give a few more examples to illustrate the false discovery rate. It's simple, but uh, let's quickly go through them. Suppose we have 200 drugs, uh, certainly as before, each with 80 patients. Uh, for 100 of, of them, they work the same as before, 50% response rate. But for 
for another 100, for the other 100, their response rates are 70%. And we, we can do the computation use R or whatever as before, we can find out in, in this situation, the power for each of them is 98%. That means for the first 100 patients, uh, first 100 drugs with 50% response rate, that five of, the, five of them will be claimed discovery. For the second 100 drugs, 98%, 98 of them will be claimed discovery. Totally so, we have 103 discoveries, but five of them is false. So in this situation, the false discovery rate is five divided by 103 is 49%. Uh, this is pretty good. False discovery rate is, is small, good news. Mm. But uh, however, usually in, in reality, we, we are not that lucky. Uh, we, we do not have half of the drugs be successful. A drug discovery is not that easy. You, you, you try many new drugs, you try new 10, of, 10 new drugs, you may get two of them uh, are really good, but the others may be the same, maybe even worse. So you expect half of them to be successful. That, that, that's way too high expectation. And then um, we, we may change that a little bit. Suppose we have 100 drugs, no improvement only in 10 drugs with the improvement, uh, improving from 50% to 70% of response rate. And if we redo the calculation, we can see in this situation, the first discovery rate is 33.8%. And 33% is of first discovery rate is, is uh, too high. We don't want that uh, this so high force discovery. So we must do something. Uh, that means we need to control the uh, force FDR, force discovery rate. Uh, certainly a, a, a natural idea. Okay, previously we used the 0.05 to claim statistical significance and uh, to claim a discovery, we can use a smaller p value 0.01 to claim a discovery. Then uh, in this situation, the number of discoveries will be uh, greatly reduced to all the way uh, from previous uh, big number to about 10.8 on average. In this situation, the first discovery rate is 9.3%. That means after we change the p-value for claiming discovery, uh, uh, we reduced the first discovery rate. Certainly in, in real life, you never know how many drugs are uh, really uh, discoveries, how many drugs are the same as before. Mm. Uh, we don't know here what I'm doing is just uh, based on assumptions. Uh, but in reality, we don't know the true numbers. Like this 100 is not good. The, uh, another 10 drugs are good. No, we don't know. We, we, we can only collect data and uh, and uh, do testing, but but uh, we we try even if we don't know, we try to fig uh, do something to have an estimate. Oh, let's see, let's try to estimate among these um, uh, one hundred ten drugs or two hundred drugs, how many of them are really better than the current ones. Sorry, I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, um, what would be an acceptable uh, false discovery rate? Oh, how, how, in terms depends. Of depends. Uh, Twenty percent, thirty percent, usually would be too high. Like five percent, uh, 
or even 10% depends on what kind of a situation you are considering uh, will be okay. Uh, like commonly used ones, 1%, 5%, uh, 10% are uh, what we commonly use depending on like how many things you are testing. If you are testing 100, 100 drugs or you are testing a 10,000 genes, you know, if you are testing 10,000 genes, you allow 10% false discovery rate, you, you may end up a lot of false discoveries. And if your next step is to, oh, I want to confirm these genes in my lab one by one, then with too many discoveries, false discoveries, you, you, you will waste a lot of money. So in that, in that situation with 10,000 genes, you may want to control the false discovery rate to 1%. Uh, it's, it's a kind of balance about cost, about potential opportunities. And it's, it's you really like, as I said, between 1%, one, uh, or to 10%, that's commonly seen, false discovery. Uh, acceptable uh, false discovery rates. Thanks, very good question. Mm -hmm. Any more Thank questions? You. Okay, uh, how to estimate like the proportion of truly now test, tests? And uh, that's something tricky. Uh, a, a very basic statistical fact is that under the non hypothesis, those p values, they are expected to have a uniform distribution between zero and one. That means if you test 100 drugs, none of them is better than the standard drug, and you get 100 p values, they are supposed to be between zero and one uniformly, like, like this uh, histogram shows. Some of them will be small, some of them be large. Yeah. And then if these 100 drugs are really good, they are all good, then what kind of p-values you will see? You will see a lot of small ones like 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03. A lot of them will be very small. And those big p-values, like a 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, there will be only a few of them, very few. Majority of them will be on the smaller end, the left end. So it's kind of skewed to, um, toward zero, it's like this histogram. And then if you combine them, the 100 drugs, no improvement, another 100 drugs with the improvement, you put them together, uh, that's the distribution. What I'm trying to show, uh, that's a combination of the previous two histograms. One is a curve uh, going down, the other one is a flat. We combine these two, what do we will get? If we combine these two, that's a, we get a mixture distribution. It will be like this. You will see like uh, the bars at the left end are a little bit higher and the bars at the right hand side are kind of more or less the same. That's the, a mixture distribution. And uh, from this mixture, we, we can estimate, oh, what is the proportion uh, from a uniform distribution and what is the proportion from a, like a, a, the distribution due to discovery, kind of left, left skew the distribution due to discovery. As people already um, developed a, a method and R function to, to do this estimation. Uh, what they did was they assumed For this distribution, they assume this is a beta distribution. 
between zero and one. And certainly this is a uniform distribution. And this is a mixture distribution. This is a beta and uniform mixture distribution. And beta, B-U-M, beta uniform mixture distribution, this, this function, BAM, if you collect all the p-values from the mixture, put them as a put them in the function as a vector, then this function can help you estimate oh how many are are, are really discoveries, how many are nows. Uh, that's um, developed by Pons and Morris in two thousand three. Uh, uh, at that time, they were considering those uh, microarray studies, but uh, similarly, we can. We can use it for drug discovery. We can use it for um, gene, gene, genetic, other genetic studies. Uh, like nowadays, we have not only microarrays. We have all the uh, advanced techniques, but it, but it's still applicable. Okay, uh, here I put it down another function, Q values, uh, which we, I will talk talk about it later. But uh, since it's, I put on this side, let me mention it. That, that means for the same list of p-values, for example, you have 200 p-values, you put, put in the function. That's our function, it's called a q-value. If you put the input the p-values, this function will give you the corresponding q-values. Uh, the q-values are developed by John Story in uh, around 2002-2003. Uh, we already talked about uh, false discovery rate, and now we should uh, uh, um, learn a new concept called a Q-value. Q-value is, is just the analog as a p-value. Uh, Q-value is defined as the minimum FDR that can be attained when calling a drug uh, significant, or the, the, the FDR, that's the expected proportion of false discovered, false positive incurred when calling that drug significant improvement. Uh, uh, for example, if a drug has a p-value point 0.002, and a Q value point 0.013. That means 1.3% of the drugs with P values less than 0.002 are false positives. That means if we use the 0.002, the P value of this drug to claim discoveries, then our chance to, to have false discoveries is the Q value of this, of this drug. That's 0 0.013. And then as we, we, as we use P value before, like if we want the type one error to be 5%, we simply claim all P values less than 5% significant. We do the same thing here. If we want the FDR to be less than 5%, we simply select all drugs with Q values less than 0.05. It's a just very straightforward uh, analog. Uh, type one area corresponding to P value, false discovery rate corresponding to Q value. Any questions here? Okay, I'll keep going. Uh, certainly, when when we when we those false discovery rates are commonly used in genetic studies. As I just said, we have uh, like thousands of genes to to consider. If we want to do a sample size and a power com computation and and the control. While we, we must control the FDR 
false discovery rate. If you want to consider 10,000 genes, and when we do power calculations, we always need to make some assumptions, make some assumptions we don't know yet, but it's just kind of pr from prior knowledge, from previous experience, uh, we have some uh, ideas like, for example, proportion of non-differentially e expressed genes, pi zero. We set this parameter, 0 0.8. This is something we don't know, but as statisticians to do power calculations, we always need to make some assumptions like this, based on common sense, common knowledge. That means only 20% of the genes, for example, have influence on our outcome of interest. 80% of them uh, have nothing to do with it. And the uh, first discovery rate, we want to control it to be less or equal to 5%, 0.05 here. FDI is said to be 0.05. And we want 80% of the power. And this, uh, what I'm going to talk about is something for the RNA sequence data, next generation RNA sequence data. So they talk about the average read count for each gene in the controller group, new, that's 10. And they, they find out that the gene, the count, the, the, the onion sequence data always give you the count. You really count data have a pass on distribution, but they find out the variation, uh, the variance in, in the real data is already, is always bigger than pass on. So negative binomial, give better feeds. Negative binomial has a dispersion parameter and this parameter is said to be 0 0.1. And uh, how big is the folder change? That's two. Uh, that's what we biologists always use. They consider the folder change of gene expressions. And this package, uh, yeah, as you can see at the bottom, SS sites, RNA. And that, that's what we can use for to do power calculations, the sample size calculations for, for genetic studies like this. And what after you apply this function, you will get this picture. What does it mean? The x-axis showing the sample size, 5, 10, 15, 20. The sample size, for example, 20 mice or 20 patients. And then we can see at 5%, the power is almost zero. At sample size equals 10, the, the power is 60%. At sample size 15, the power is more than 80%. Uh, more than 80% is good. Uh, but if you don't have that much, um, funding to do the experiment. Uh, then here, like at sample size 14, that's already higher than 80%. So this is a graph to show the power level. How does it change as the sample size increases? And certainly when you do power calculations, you can you can change the false discovery rate from 1%, 5%, 10%, or anywhere between. And the number of genes, how many you consider all these things, you specify them, and you can you can get this nice uh, power sample size uh, graph for consulting with the uh, biologists. Okay, uh, I hope all these uh, are straightforward. Mm. And then as we learn statistics, there are always mathematical theory behind it, mathematical notations. Uh, the false discovery rate was uh, kind of proposed by uh, a paper in 1995 and they presented a table like this. Mm. Suppose uh, 
we have to do totally M, the little M, that's the number of tests we have to do. For example, previously 200 drugs, M equals 200. 10,000 genes, M equals 10,000. Then among the 10,000 genes, how many of them you think will be truly uh, differentially expressed under some conditions? That's the part of the alternative true. Those without change, that's a null hypothesis is true. That's M0. Uh, in the previous power calculation, the M0 is 8,000 out of 10,000. Certainly the alternative will be 2,000 out of 10,000, okay? And after we do the testings, uh, how many out of the 10,000 tests, how many we call significant, how many we don't call significant? The number of significance is R. Number of non-significant certainly then it's M minus R. R will be the total number of discoveries. And the V, that's those false discoveries. V divided by R will be the false discovery rate. But actually false discovery rate is defined as the, the expectation of this. As I, as I just said, the false discovery rate is the expected fraction of rejections. That's a false rejections. V divided by R. And how to control the false discovery rate? Uh, uh, later on, we, we will show you a procedure. As in the original paper in 1995, I just mentioned, Benjamin and the Hochberg in 1995. Sorry, Dr. Huang. Yeah. Um, uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know if you can access those yes, I, uh, questions. I, or... I, can, I can read them. I can read them. Um, oh, one second. Uh, yeah, please yeah. read to me. I don't yeah. see the chat. It's, this was in the previous, this is Jessica Pasol. In the previous graph of power versus sample size, how the 80% target line was determined. Uh, I think it was the previous, the previous uh, eighty percent power. target line was determined. Uh, let's go back to understand your question. Uh, hmm. uh -huh, that one. So you have an eighty percent power here line. Oh. Why? Why do I draw a line, uh, horizontal horizontal line at just eighty right. percent? This is just right. by convention. Uh, uh, it's just like uh, the five percent is by convention. This eighty percent is also by convention. Like uh, when we consider some biology experiments, we usually say we want to have eighty percent of power. When the power is too low, you will miss real discoveries. When the when the power is too high. It's a good thing as long as you have enough money to do all the extra experiments. Uh, we, we want the power to be 100%, but that's never achievable. To achieve power 99%, you may need a sample size of, for example, 100. But a sample size of 100 probably mean for, for the biologists that you have to buy 100 mice to do experiments. Uh, they need money to buy the mice. They need uh, the lab technicians to work on those mice. All, all of these things cost them money, and, uh, which is limited. So we, we need to achieve some kind of balance between uh, the convention is to set at 80%, and you really uh, too low, lower than 80%, we, we miss too much. Higher than 80% is, is too costly. As you can see, after the 80%, you, you see from here, the sample size increase, the power increase very slowly. But before that, 
As sample size increase, the power increase sharply. So 80% is kind of convention balance point. Do I answer your question here? Yes. I okay. Think so. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so You're well, nice there's question. another one. Is, uh, is, is the Q value only used for multiple replications of a study that is testing multiple drugs for the same purpose? Or can it also be used to control type 1 error in multiple comparison studies similar to Tukey and Bonferroni uh, corrections, but hoc? Oh, very good question. Uh, very good question. I... I would say usually uh, I would reserve Q values for uh, a large number of uh, tests, like at least 100, usually in thousands, those kind of genetic gene studying. Uh, uh, that means you have many things to test, you miss one or two of them, uh, it's okay. Um, and what are the other tests like a two key and the buffaroning? Uh, for buffaroning, I will I will talk a little bit later. Um, they are like you have ten drugs to test, and each of them is is expensive. You don't want to miss um, any of them. In second, of, or to say, as for small number of tests like ten twenty. Then we will consider those tests like uh, Turkey, Buffaroni. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's usually in different settings. Uh, that's, that's the answer for, for this question. But it, this is a very good question. Yeah. Q values are developed in the, in the modern uh, time of genetic genomics studies to test thousands of genes. And for doing the, before that, if we have five drugs to test, we use turkey, we use buffaroni, uh, that's good enough. Uh, you don't have to use Q values. Uh, and um, uh, at that time, it, it's important to control the family-wise type one area, which we will talk later, uh, and uh, instead of the false discovery rate. And that, any, any other questions? Right. I, I think we should continue to talk about okay. because it's 115, yeah. Okay. Uh, some other terminology is like per comparison error rate. That's the expected value of number of type one errors over the number of hypotheses tested. And more, a more important concept is a family-wise error rate. For example, you do you have ten drugs, you do ten tests, and what is the error rate after you uh, consider the ten tests? That's called the family-wise. Uh, if you have one hundred tests, uh, you have. 5% chance to make type 1 error for, what, for, for each one of them. Then what is the family-wise error rate? The calculation is showing here. The chance to be correct is 95%, 1 minus 0.05. And 95%, you want 100 of them to be correct. That's 95% raised to the power of 100. That's the chance to be 100% correct. And one minus that is the chance you have any error, any mistake. And this chance to, to have of mistake is 99.4%. It's really high. That means even if you only allow 5% to make a mistake, but if you repeat the same thing 100 times for sure, you, you will make at least one mistake. So uh, that shows how the family-wise error rate could be very high, even though the each type one error is pretty low. Um, that back to the question, like, 
depends on your, your purpose. Uh, do you really want like to control the type of area that I don't wake up? I don't want to make any mistake. You really is not. You, you have what, 10,000 genes, you miss a few, it's okay. Uh, you, you just want to make sure like, uh, finally you decided to do experiments on 100 genes, you want to at least 90, 90 of them are, are interesting to you. Uh, you. And there are 20, 30 of you missed, uh, it's fine. So that's why we use the false discovery rate. And people already asked the Bufferoni method. How do we do it? Uh, suppose we have 100 hypothesis tests and the Bufferoni method is use a, as I said, we can use a smaller p-value. Suppose alpha is 0.05 and the bufferoni test is to use alpha divided by 100 that will be 0. 0.0005 a really small number for two. and uh, owning owning a p value is less than this really small number and you claim a discovery and a lot of times you will miss a lot of things by doing this way this is very simple, but way too conservative and, and overly con conservative. So we don't really do that when the M is large. We do that when the M is small. For example, you can see the three drugs, five drugs, 10 drugs, that's okay. But if you consider 1,000 genes, 10,000 genes, we, we don't use this method. And the false discovery rate, as I mentioned, is developed for massive genomic studies, proteomic studies, those arrays, all kinds of arrays. And controlling an overall type one area, that's a family-wise type one area. It does not work and actually does not make sense. And so false discovery rate, uh, it's good enough. And how to control the false discovery rate? There are a few, uh, a few procedures. So this one is called Holman's method. That means like if you have 100 p-values, you rank them from smallest to largest. And for the first one, you look at it. Is it less than 0.05 divided by 100? If yes, you accept this one. For the second one, is it smaller than 0.05 divided by 99? If yes, you accept this one and go to next. Every time the denominator becoming smaller by one and the uh, hormon prove that if you do it this way, the family-wise error rate is less than alpha. And uh, this is also called uh, adjusted p-values. It's kind of like, uh, for the first p-value, you multiply it by 100. For the second p-value, you multiply it by 99 and keep going like this. Uh, you got adjusted p-values. And uh, remember, we, here we are working on those uh, ordered, sorted p-values from smallest to the largest. And a slightly improved version. That's by the Benjamin and Holtzberg, 1995. Instead of this, like uh, multiply as previously said by 199, 98, uh, here is, is a slightly different. Uh, this example here used uh, Let's change this 100 to 15 This in this example. Instead of uh, here is multiplied by 15 and then 15 divided by two, 
15 divided by 3, 15 divided by 4, 15 divided by 5. And you can see that by doing this on the right hand table, uh, those colored ones are the ones we, we claim discovery. So by the hormones method, we, we claim three discoveries. And by the uh, new approach by Benjamini and Holtberg, we, we, we can claim four discoveries. And the Benjamini and Holtberg proved that by their new method, they improved the power, but they still control the FDR to be 5% or less. So that's a good thing. That means the hormones method is a, a little bit too, too conservative. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that uh, I used some of the slides by uh, Professor Susan Hinsenberg in the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. I would like to thank the support um, to, of this um, uh, U54 grant, the UPR Emily Anderson Partnership for Excellence in Cancer Research, and um, Dr. Parici and I are the co-directors for the call uh, for statistics. And those key references, uh, the 1995 paper, proposed the concept of false discovery rate. And the paper by Story, John Story proposed the idea of Q value. Any questions? Uh, that's it for today's talk. Thanks very much. Uh, Thanks Professor to all of Wang. you. Thanks for your invitation. It's my pleasure to give a lecture here. And thanks for all the collaborations. Uh, it's, it's my great experience too. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, bye-bye.